All right. Hi, I am Mary Poplin with Forest Effects. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Adjust Track. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you correct a track when it's drifted and also how you correct it when it's really difficult to see all, you hit my microphone, all four points. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about tracks that go off screen and then how to adjust those. So ask your questions in the chat. I will be looking over at this screen from time to time and I will go ahead and see your questions and I'll answer them as best I can. Um, and now we're going to just go ahead and get started. So let's cut over to my screen. All right, and let's talk a little bit about screen tracking in general. So when we're tracking screens, one of the things that you see when, um, when people film is you'll see that they'll try to film live screens. You cannot film live screens because the refresh rate is often at counter, <laughs> uh, at a counter bit of math to the um, refresh rate of your sensor and your camera. So you end up with this nonsense where you have this stuttering through your screen. So in general, it's best to film something and then to put something onto that. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we are going to replace this. Now I'm not gonna replace this today because uh, this is just a shot that I was using as an example to show you why we don't film screens. We don't film screens because of these black bars that are going through this. Now I'm going to focus on a shot that's a little bit more challenging than this. This is, this is not very challenging. Okay. And the reason it's not is because we can always just track this wall and we're done. The screen is tracked and we don't have to worry about going off screen or anything like that. But stuff like this is really challenging to track. Stuff like this is really challenging to track. Okay. And stuff like this is really challenging to track and they're different. They're challenging for different reasons. Like they all go off screen, but they have different challenges to them. And the first thing I'd kind of like to talk about is this one, um, because a lot of times with, when people are tracking a shot like this, what they'll do is they'll think that all they have to do is just track the screen. Um, is just track the screen and go. Uh, but unfortunately, I can see in this shot that there's quite a bit of what we call lens warping in the shot. And if you don't solve for that lens first, no amount of tracking is going to get you a good track on this screen. So let's talk a little bit about how to handle that. Uh, we have a further challenge in that if you look at the screen, you've got a guy on it, right? Because it's filming. So and what did we say earlier about filming stuff on a screen? Now you will notice that the uh, refresh rate is not is not a real problem here. So like happily, you can see what's on that monitor without it being terrible. But for a clearer picture, you may need to replace that or you might need to replace it for a visual effects shot. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for this screen. Now, I haven't touched this shot yet, um, so we're going to be working on these just kind of from scratch. Um, I decided to do this this morning uh, because we have some users that have been wondering about Adjust Track and I wanted to sort of address some of the questions they've been having about footage. So let's go ahead and put Mocha Pro onto our layer here. Now, once again, this is using the Mocha Pro plugin. This works in Nuke, it works in After Effects, it works in Premiere, it works in Avid, it works in the Fusion tab of Resolve, but it has to work in the Fusion tab, not the Resolve tab. So all of that means that you can use this plugin anywhere in your host pipeline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch Mocha and Mocha is going to read directly off my timeline. Great. Now I don't use the standalone anymore, but a lot of new users like to use the standalone because they can tab between the two. Uh, one of the limitations of working within a piece of software that is a plugin means that you do have the plugin take over the interface. Um, we don't want you to have to deal with the interface. Um, in some cases, so you can use the standalone, but in this case, we're using the plugin. And let's first things first, let's look at the order of the tabs here in Mocha. Okay. Now, when we're working in Mocha, you have your clip tab. Your clip tab is where you can make sure that all of your settings are correct, your aspect ratios, etc. This matters more. Excuse me. <laughs> Pardon me. This matters more um, <laughs> in the um in a standalone, but it's where you can see all your settings for your footage. Uh, and we work in a right, I mean, a left to right uh, tab workflow in Mocha. So 
The next thing you would do is after you check your clip settings, you would check and make sure there's no lens warping in your shot. I can see that there's lens warping in the shot, so I have to solve for that. We can do that a couple of different ways. Um, we do have a new way to solve for lenses. So we can either use locate lines and Mocha will tell us what lines it thinks needs to be straight. We can hit in for new line and we can try to calibrate, but I don't want to do that. Okay. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to use splines. So I'm going to say use splines. Okay. And I'm going to make some new splines on my screen, just like this. All right. I'm going to make some new splines just like this. And what we're doing is we're tracing splines in the scene. And this will tell us how to calibrate our lens. Now we could do the in for new line and connect the dots thing. But this is a new workflow. And I figured since we're talking about adjust track and we're talking about some new tools, we might cover some of these tools and have it help a little bit. So we also want to make sure that we get close to the edges because that's where the most distortion is happening. And it's important to make sure that you get those edges correct. So once again, let's come here and grab this edge. There we are. And we'll grab some vertical lines too, right here. All right, so what we're doing is we're finding the lines that we know should be straight and we can see are not straight and we're tracing them. And then we're gonna use that to create our lens calibration. So let's select all these and let's go ahead and do a one parameter distortion and hit calibrate. And if we turn our little surface tool on here, I mean our grid tool on here, we can see that that is the curve of our lens. Okay, so this is really handy because you want to go ahead and do this first thing. Um, I see a comment in here that says we that uh, they've always used Red Giant's lens distort solving tool. Never knew Mocha Pro has one of its own. Yeah, this has been in Mocha and Mocha Pro, gosh, um, for for a long, long time, like kind of since the inception. And it's one of those tools that in Mocha, a lot of people will use Mocha for like specifically one task. You know, they'll get in a habit where they only use Mocha for one thing and they don't realize that Mocha is kind of a Swiss army knife tool for a bunch of things. When you're tracking, this will certainly save you a lot of time. Same thing for when you're doing any removes. A lot of times somebody will do a remove and they'll have a real problem with their remove. They won't know why it doesn't look right. And the reason it doesn't look right is because they never accounted for that lens warp. Um, in general, a VFX pipeline does undistort footage before you do visual effects and then redistorts it afterwards to match. Um, but we allow you to work right on the footage, whether it's been distorted or not. And this is one of the ways that we do that. Okay, so now that we've calibrated, we can move to the track tab. Okay, and remember I said we're working left to right, and that is true for everything in Mocha. So it goes clip, lens, track, and then if there's a problem with your track, you jump to the adjust, trab, uh, adjust track tab. Everything else is an exit module. So the camera solver, insert, mega plates, remove, stabilize, and reorient are their own exit module. And you would use them depending on what you're trying to do with the shot. So what I mean by exit module is I mean, that's your last step. So if you're doing a remove and you need to do an adjust track, obviously you would do the adjust track before you did the remove. But once you're done with the remove, that's what you've done with that Mocha file. Um, I highly recommend that once you've completed a lens solve and a track in Mocha that you go ahead and go to like file and you like save project or export your project right as a um, track file. And then you can use it for if you have multiple tasks you need to do, you can always load that file back in. It's a good workflow. Um, always save often, save early and save in versions, right? So now we've got all of those, um, those little splines. We're going to ignore them in our track tab. Let's just go ahead and grab them, put them in a little folder and call this lens. And we'll just go ahead and turn those off and hide them and lock them. And we don't have to worry about them anymore. Okay, we've just put them away. Um, now, let's go ahead and start tracking. Um, I see we have a question in here, um, Intel i9 versus M1 Max for Mocha Pro. Um, what do I suggest? Uh, I would go ahead and look at our tech specs on the website and um, and then you can you can make your best call from there. Uh, tech specs are not really my thing. Um, so uh, check out our tech specs on the website www.boriseffects.com. Click on Mocha Pro on the far left hand, I mean on the far right hand tab uh, on that web page will be a little thing that says tech specs. Click on that and you can see all our tech specs for Mocha. And it's 
it's just something I don't have off the top of my head. Okay, so you can see that I have my grid on. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my grid off. All right, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start tracking the screen. So I'll take my primitive little X spline here and we'll just draw a nice big X right around the outside of this screen, just like this. We wanna make sure that we leave a few pixels on the outside, but we don't wanna end up with something where we're tracking a lot of background. So just make sure that you're not leaving a lot of background to track. Notice how I am relaxing for a curve to get that nice little curve on the edge of my shot. Next, we're gonna use the add to X spline, okay? And we're gonna go ahead and just X out this middle section here, okay? Now, the reason I'm doing that is because we've got all of this, all of this action happening right in here inside of this little area. And if I turn my mask on, you can see that because we've added to the X spline here, wherever the shapes are outside of each other, they add, and wherever they're inside of each other, they subtract. Okay, this is really handy for when you're trying to track something like this. You wanna make sure that you are not tracking all of this non-planar motion on the inside of your footage. So let's go ahead and turn our masks off and let's turn our surface tool on. I'm gonna align my surface tool to this screen right here, just like this. And we're gonna make sure that this lines up pretty nicely because I'm using this as my visual guide as we track. Okay, and now I'm gonna call this screen track. Okay, we wanna make sure we name our layers. It's a sanitary workflow so that when you pass this shot off to somebody, you don't have layer one through 47 and they wonder what in the world you were doing with that. Kind of like how I put all of these lens layers right here into this folder. It's, it's just so that we can tell ourselves and our coworkers what our layers are doing, okay? Now we can track translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective for this screen, okay? We wanna do that because the screen is moving in Z space. It's not just a total um, X and Y pan. So now let's go ahead and hit track forwards. I can generally leave my settings the way they are. Um, I don't have to do any pre-processing, but if I needed to, I could do some pre-processing with some contrast and some um, denoise and all kinds of new tools here. This is actually new in the newest version of Mocha Pro. Let's go ahead and hit track forwards. And it looks pretty good to me. It's holding on. I like the way it's holding on, looking good, feeling good about it. And let's see if we can get this to track off screen. Now we may be able to get it to track off screen fairly decently, okay? But I can already see that we are slipping some. All right, you can see that we're slipping just a little bit. So we are going to have to use adjust track to fix this. Let's go ahead and let this track off screen. Track, 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 track. See how good it holds on. I haven't, yeah, we're, we're losing it. Okay, so we've started to lose that track about here. Um, and that's because what we're doing is we're having a little bit of a shift that's happening. Um, you can see where the object is sort of tilting and that's because of this is probably shot on a DSLR and it's shot in low light. So what we're seeing is we're seeing that tilt as the camera is reading the information and the sensor is literally reading it in a line. And that line is being recorded um, as the camera is moving and it's giving us this effect of being printed in parallels, right? So we're gonna go ahead and turn perspective off and we're gonna move just to uh, shear only. And that's gonna give us some of that shear motion. Let's see if we get anything a little bit better as we track with just shear a little bit, but now we're really starting to shear too much. Okay, so right here, I, right here, I feel like I'm really starting to lose it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move to translation only. I'm gonna use my add to X-Blind tool um, right here, and I'm gonna grab some of this information here. All right, now this is not perfect information, but we're just gonna grab some of this information here. Let me turn my, turn my, um, oh, I'll have to turn it off in a second. There we go, grab this, here we are. All right, so we're grabbing that extra information right there. And we'll grab a little bit of this extra information right down here as well. So I'm cheating, right? This is, this is what I call cheating, where we start to grab extra information that's not necessarily the screen, but is moving similarly. Similarly is the key. And because we're only tracking translation, we don't care as much because we're gonna co correct this with adjust track, okay? So translation only, grabbing similar shapes. And let's see. 
Yeah, that's slightly prettier. Okay, slightly better, but we're still gonna have to do a lot of correction. No problem. Let's go ahead and let's track that off screen. Oh, we've lost it. All right, so now we're gonna do one more thing here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up on this shape. So you see, every time I encounter a problem, what am I doing? I'm adding more information to track, okay? And taking away any problematic information. So what we're doing is we're adding more to track and getting rid of things like this light that might distract us, okay? But making sure that we're holding on to the data where there's texture, okay? So let's go ahead and keep tracking forwards. All right, not perfect, but we can do something with that. So our, our screen's completely off screen. So now we can start doing our adjust track, all right? So it looks like a mess, but what we're gonna do start doing is we're gonna start using our adjust track. So here we are, here's our track. You can see it's starting to slip and it still just slips just a little too much here at the end. We're not gonna worry about that because we're just going to use adjust track to get it right off the screen. Okay, so this is what I would call a good, good in, in, in super quotes, base track, all right? I'm gonna turn off my translation tool because I don't need it right now. All right, and let's just take a look at that. Let's play this back and forth. Yeah, I can see that slipping pretty badly over time and then really badly there. No problem though. So now let's go ahead and let's go to adjust track. We have a classic version of adjust track, which is you adjust all four points and you it's a little bit more tedious, okay? Um, we're gonna work with this adjust track, which allows us to translate either based on translation only or two, two points of correction, which is translation and scale, um, translation scale and rotation, okay? And then also perspective. Um, I see a question here, which is, so there's not really a handy way to do a point track in Mocha. I sometimes need translation data only, but often end up using AE's tracker. Okay, so point trackers and feature trackers. Let me just explain this really quick while we're talking, and I'm gonna go ahead and hit play on this so that we're just not staring at an empty screen while I talk. Um, okay, point trackers and feature trackers only track a very small amount of data. And what Mocha does is Mocha tracks an entire texture that moves in one direction, okay? So we call that planar data. And I'll give you an example. Like if you're tracking my hand, um, these pixels are moving relative to these pixels and these pixels together, we call that a plane, okay? But this is moving separately. So this is not on the same plane. We don't look for features. So like for instance, my, my wedding ring tattoo here, um, this would be a good point or feature track, right? But if I didn't have that, the back of my hand would be something that Mocha could track because it tracks textures, okay? And we could include this in it to help it, but it's a whole texture track. If you want just the translation data, we do export that actually. Um, it's right here in the surface tool. When you export Mocha data, we have the surface tool that translates all of our data out to a track, depending on how you apply it. The four corners are a corner pin, but this little center cross here, that is your translation data. Okay, so that is what I want you to think of as the translation data. It just means that we're tracking that plane and then we're converting that planar data into a point track. You can even do a one point point track correction using translation only in the adjust track module. So yes, there is a way to get that data out as transform data, but the way the tracker tracks itself, no, we don't track points and features, we track areas of texture, and we can't really track less than 20 by 20 pixels of texture. And obviously the more planar data that you give Mocha, the more texture that you give it, the more accurate it will be. This also means that we can track through blurs and lighting changes where we wouldn't necessarily be able to with a point tracker. And I hope that is a really, really thorough, um, a thorough answer. Ah. I am seeing that uh, my picture in picture is over where the track is slipping. So let's just go ahead and cut to a place where we don't have picture in picture. And here we are. All right, so now, how about that? We can see where the track is slipping. There we are. Thank you for telling me I am, um, I am uh, directing these and, and being in them at the same time. So I often can't see what's going on on the screen very well. I appreciate you letting me know. Um, okay, now, so here's where our track is slipping. With all of that uh, info dump that I just gave you on how the tracker works, let's go ahead and jump into how to use this adjust track, all right? So 
I know that I need four points of corner correction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in really good here. I'm going to uh, turn my, uh, let's see, I'm going to turn my splines off really quick so I'm not looking at them. I'm going to turn my thumbnails off really quick so they're not in the way. I'm going to use my selection tool and I'm going to align this as absolutely perfectly as I can. And we're going to use the X button, which is the pan tool, so that I can pan around to all four of these corners and I can get this surface, I mean, just dead nailed on these corners, okay? And the reason I'm doing that is because I wanna make sure when I do my correction that this is 100% correct. But here's the other thing I want you to notice. Because we corrected for that lens warp, look, our surface tool is now nicely curved along with the edge of our screen. That means that I know that we did that lens uh, correction properly and also now that I can correct using these four corners. Okay. And yeah, so this crosses your transform, all four corners of your corner pin. Okay, let's go to translation skill, shear, and perspective. We're gonna we're going to correct for all of those points, and now we have to set them. So we're saying, I want you to set these four corners at the corners of my surface tool. I can move them if I want, okay, but I don't want. Okay, I want to leave them at the four corners of my surface. Now, if you need to, like let's say there was no good data there, I could move this point here. And then the surface tool is not tied to that, but I like to tie these to the surface because then I can really see using the surface tool as a guide um, where my corners need to be. It's just gonna depend on what workflow you prefer. Okay, we're gonna select our points by hitting the select button and we're gonna hit set reference frame. What that will do is this will make this now my reference frame. So when I jump ahead to where my, um, my track starts to slip, which it turns out is just right here, okay. Yeah, we're gonna look for the arcs of the animation where it's the most different. So about here, okay, now I can start to adjust these points and look. Now they will adjust my surface tool, okay? So I'm going to select these points and I'm gonna use, let's do, let's select this point and let's use auto to try to align it. Select that point and use auto. And you see what it'll do is it will try, let's select this point here. You can see that it gets larger and we hit auto. And you can see what Mocha's trying to do. Mocha's trying to align this automatically for me. And that's really handy, all right? But there's gonna be a point where auto isn't going to help me anymore, okay? And that point is going to be where we start to go off screen. But for now, what we can do is we can correct this based on my auto flow. I can also use my favorite tool here. The, um, this is called the, um, the activate quick stabilize mode, okay? And what it does is it pins my object into the middle of the screen based on my track. So you see how I, it's staying on screen? Really helpful when, you, when you're doing a just track, you see, because now that's what my track is doing. And if I didn't do it that way, if I turned this off, this is gonna jump all over the place. I don't want it to jump all over the place, okay? What I wanna do is I want to pin it in the middle of the screen so I can see what I'm doing. Um, is there a way to move these all at once? Um, I think actually we are still working on that. However, yeah, let's let's check. Yeah, we have to, that is a feature request that we have in um, for moving them all at once. If you want to move them all at once, it's a one point correction. And I realize that's a little bit frustrating, but I use the edges of the screen and then I also use things like the um, ROI to help with that. So let's go ahead and jump forward and look again for an up. So we're starting to slip again, right? Where's our gap? So here looks, yeah, here looks pretty good. So let's go ahead and correct this frame. So we've got a gap from here to here and I can see that the slip is slow over time. So let's select this, auto, select that corner, auto, Select again, auto, select again, auto. Okay, and now I should be able to correct over time again. So we're looking for last good bit of data, auto, and then auto, auto, and auto. 
I'm feeling pretty good about that. Now let's zoom between them because I believe, yeah, about, yep, about here, it slips again. So let's correct that, correct, correct, and correct. And I actually don't like the way that corrected. So let's select this point. And now let's do some nudging. All right, so we can nudge these based on little half pixel movements. And I can select my points or I can use selection to select them. And we're going to zoom this out this way and zoom this down. There we go. And go up here and correct this as well. Adjust. All right, so. All right, so that looks pretty good to me. And you can see that we have to correct these two. And then we're going to have to correct this. And I'm just going to correct these by hand because we're starting to shift. All right, and now we're starting to get into the tricky spot, which is where we're starting to really lose it. So I've got to find my last good arced frame, okay, where we're still right before we start jumping, okay? So you can see that we've got a good track up until about here, okay? So now this is where my last correction is going to be. We're going to correct to this corner correct to this corner, correct to where I think the corner is, which I think is right here. Now, here's where we can start to do some interesting stuff. Um, we can sort of adjust this based on the edges. All right, so let's just look. And I can see that I am twisting up a little bit more than I would like. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust this just like this and make sure that this is correct. So what I like to do is animate between the two and see if it looks right. If it doesn't look right, then I know that we have got to do some more adjustments. So I can see right here that we have a problem. So we've got to jump this over and move it up a little bit. All right, so scrolling between these two, we're going to have to do some hand corrections, just like this. And so what happens is you end up having to do a little bit of, well, it's a little aggravating. You have to sort of correct things based on whether or not it looks correct. And that's sort of the deal with visual effects in general. You have to correct it based on what looks correct. So let's take these and let's start to correct them now that they're going totally off screen. So here's our last, this is the last bit we're going to see our screen on, okay? So I'm going to select this, all of these, okay, and we're going to move them over. So there's a good question here, which is when should you use manual track instead or let the track slip and adjust it? Um, honestly, like here would be a good section to use manual track, right? Because you could just jump the whole thing over. Um, in which case, uh, I can show you how to do that. So let's uh, jump to here where we have these bad, this bad data. Okay, we're going to jump back to our track tab. We're going to go over into our track tab. And here we're going to hit manual track. And you can see that I have all of these keyframes here that are a problem. Let's go into our dope sheet. And let's scroll this down. That was a really good question. Let's jump over here to our tracking data points. And you can see this is our track. Okay, and these are all our keyframes. Let's get rid of them. We select and delete. Very nice. All right. Now, what I'd like to do here is I'd like to make a keyframe. All right. This keyframes my manual track. That is important. One of the main things that people mess up on when they do a manual track is they will um, they will not make a keyframe. And the problem with not making a keyframe is if you don't make a keyframe, um, all of your keys back this way will be offset by whatever you didn't make your keyframe on. Okay. So let's scroll over here. And let's just nudge this all the way up. So now we've got an adjust track where we can just move the surface to create our track just like this. All right. All right, so we can still do our adjust track or we can hand animate this track just like this where we've got our track going off screen. So that's another way that you can do that. Many, many ways to skin this cat, so to speak. All right. So 
Let's go ahead and jump back to our large motion. Let's make sure that we have our surface tool exactly where we want it. I see that we have some offset there that I'll have to figure out what went on there. And let's scroll through and see what this looks like now. All right, I'm feeling pretty good about that. All right, so what we can do from here is we can go ahead and put a screen insert on just like this. Let's go to an insert clip. I'm just going to put a logo over it and let's play and see what this ends up looking like. Looks pretty good. Uh, let's go to our just track one more. Let's go to our manual track one more time and make sure that we are actually leaving the frame. Um, let's go to our manual track, please. And let's select our selection tool. And yeah, there we go. All right. So using a combination of manual track and adjust track, we have something that looks pretty good to me. All right. So now what we can do is we can further massage this. Um, in this case, we can do things like use the insert module. I can come over here. And while we are still in a sort of a crisp view, you know, um, we can use motion blur and we can render this with motion blur. So I'm not going to use an actual, um, I'm not going to use an actual, uh, insert here because I'm not doing a full composite, but I do just want to show you what this would look like if we rendered it. Let's go ahead and hit render forwards. Let's make sure our gear is off, render forwards. And we've got this sort of situation. Now, one of the questions that got asked was when you should when you should use adjust track and when you should use manual track. Uh, when you have to invent tracking data wholesale because there's a total occlusion or something's completely gone, manual track is a good way to go. When you have a track that is off and needs a little bit of massaging, that's when you would use adjust track. So adjust track is not really good for correcting all four corners um, over time very well. Um, but as we just showed you, manual track is a good way to get all four of those corners corrected using the surface tool. So manual track is actually where Mocha gets a little confusing <laughs> for a lot of people. So in general, when you're tracking inside of Mocha, the shape is where the track is looking and the surface tool is what the track is doing. Okay. The surface tool is the translation data for what mathematically is happening inside of Mocha's brain. Okay. And that's how we find and see what is being, um, what is being translated out by the tracker. Okay. Now that's well and good. Uh, but, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that the surface and the shape are a child of the track. The track is invisible math data that just exists inside of Mocha. And then what we do is we use that data for various processes and tasks. Okay. In this case, what we're doing is we're doing a track using manual tracks and adjust tracks in order to get a final screen track. Okay. So when you are adjusting the track, you are making a four point corner pin correction over the top of the track. When you're using manual track, you're actually breaking the parent child relationship and you're having the surface tool become a tool for a minute that allows us to visually create the track data where there is no math available, like where Mocha cannot read anything, where Mocha cannot create tracking data. We are giving it fake tracking data. We're giving it a visual input for four corners um, that we're calling the track. And that's what manual track does. It breaks the parent child relationship of the track and it makes it to where we are now manually driving the track. That's why we call it manual track. So this is a pretty difficult track. This is a challenging track. This is a track that goes off screen completely. Um, there, there's a change in focal distance. Um, we have a problem where we have a change in, um, in how it's uh, visualized on screen. It's handheld and it goes totally off screen. So what we've done here, just to recap, is we have tracked. Use manual track where it went off screen. Use adjust track to correct any data in between the two. And then we use the insert module to put a screen in over the top. The reason I use the insert module here and why I think it's a better choice for this type of shot is because otherwise we would need to be in a compositor like After Effects or Nuke 
um, and we would need to be using a lens warp. We'd be need, you know, like a like a lens ST map. We'd be needing to use a corner pin. We'd be needing to use a uh, motion blur no node like O flow or uh, motion blur or optical flow, any of that. Um, and we are not using those. So what we're doing is we're all doing that right inside of Mocha, where we're now accounting for the lens inside of Mocha. We're moving everything along with the tracking data in Mocha, and we're applying motion blur in Mocha. And that's why I like this a little bit better for this type of difficult shot. It sort of really takes a lot of the pain out of these sorts of difficult screen inserts. So does anybody have any questions on that? Or should we move on to a different shot? Because we've got about 25 minutes left. And I'm going to look in the chat and see if we have any questions. All right, I don't see any, so there we go. All right, so you can see here, I just wanna point out one more thing. Every time we track in Mocha in the track tab, okay, you're gonna see all of the blue areas are areas where we have track data, the track math, so to speak, right? All of the red data is where there is no math data. So all we've done here is we've created one, two, three points of fake data, fake tracking data, and Mocha has shown us where we have put those, okay? So if your tracking bar is red, it means that you have no tracking data on your bar. All right. Let me just tell check our chat here. Perfect. All right, we're going to save this and we're going to close it. All right, and that is one track. Now back in your um, host, you can go to Hey, render and insert composite, it will render it right back to your timeline inside of whatever timeline you are in. So you can also do things like add a blur onto this. So I could do like an insert cutout only, and then I could come in here and I could add like a, let's do like a box blur. Um, we could do like a fast box blur right here. Let's go ahead and duplicate this and delete these off the bottom. Here we are. So I could come over here to about, where do we, where do we start to have a problem? Yeah, about here. And I could say, hey, let's render a new blur radius and let's do like, I don't know, do a blur radius of like five here. Maybe, maybe 20 actually. Yeah, that's more accurate. Okay, so now we can animate that blur as we move off screen, just like that. So many, many opportunities to change how you composite in Mocha. All right, moving right along, let's talk about another shot. Um, this would use the same kind of technique. This is actually one of those things where it's really an example of why you would never wanna do this. Uh, never film, look, I'm just gonna play this really quick. Why is this person filming what is actually on their screen? Why? Now, Nobody can control what we see here without having to reinvent a new screen, a new reflection, and paint out things like these logos, okay? Like, don't do this. Don't do this. This is not a good way to film things. You know, not the least of which you get this, like, look how low res that is, you know? It's because, and blurry. This is just not something you're going to catch in camera very well ever at all. If you ever want to do this, Consider either filming a low saturation green screen so that you can pull keys, okay? Um, or consider filming just like a light gray or off screen, okay? And that way, if you don't need the glow, you can film it off. If you need the glow, then go ahead and film like light gray or desat green, okay? And what you're gonna end up with is a much, much, much nicer screen that you can create visual effects on. Um, this is just never going to read right when you are showing something on screen, okay? Whenever you're doing visual effects work, don't film the screen, all right? It just looks terrible. So that's a good example. Yes, turning off the screen is often better. Sometimes you do need the glow, though, and rebuilding the glow in visual effects is a total pain. So it's a trade-off, you know? And if you don't want to deal with green spill, you can make it gray many, many options here. Okay. Um, but be thoughtful about the way you're filming. I, I see somebody in here says, please just turn the screen off. Yes. 90% of the time, especially with things like phones, just turn the screen off um, because you can get that glow in post pretty easily. But if you're doing like dramatic lighting, 
just make sure that when you're doing that dramatic lighting, you have just like a gray solid on here. And don't do the thing that people do unless you absolutely have to. And I mean have to because you're zooming in past the edges of the screen. Don't put tape or X's or tracking markers and stuff all over it because usually the edges of the screen are enough to get the data with. And while it is a pain to hand correct a track, it is a whole lot easier to do that than it is to paint out things under a reflection, which are a huge, 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 huge pain to do. I know I have done my share of those shots. Okay, so moving right along, let's talk about this shot. Okay, let's say we wanna put something on yeah, unless the bezel is totally invisible. Yes, you're correct. Um, all right. So let's say we want to put something on the screen because, um, I don't know, our, our director or editor is like really into continuity and they're just, you absolutely have to see the edge of this for some reason. Okay. Um, then we kind of have a problem because how do we judge what's going on with the shot? How do we judge well, like what the aspect ratio is? How do we judge where the corners are? Yuck. Awful. Well, luckily, um, this shot is a little bit not as bad as it could be, okay? And that's because we have details here and here uh, in order to grab tracking information. Now, right here, we're gonna be, right here, it's gonna be a little hairy, but we can probably get through it, okay? So let's talk about how we would track this shot and put a surface tool into this that would be a good screen, all right, for, for this shot. Oh, not fast box blur, I don't wanna put you on there. I wanna put Mocha Pro on here, Mocha. Pro, drag and drop, boom. Okay, so we've got Mocha Pro. We're gonna launch it. It's gonna read from our timeline. And here's Mocha, all right? Let's do this later. All right, now let's start tracking this screen. I'm gonna see if I can get away with tracking this without using any um, masks um, for the fingers. I might get away with it because they're moving quickly. I might not though, but let's find out. So as usual in Mocha, you wanna track where you have areas of the most detail, the least blur, okay? Largest in frame and most parallel to the camera. I do not have all of those in the shot. So I'm gonna pick this little area right here. Okay, I'm gonna use my X-Blind tool. Excuse me. I'm going to grab this data right here. And that's it. That's going to be the area that I'm tracking for this screen. Okay. Now I could, I can see that the screen is pretty dirty and they probably should have run a alcohol wipe on it. And I can see, I hope that's not spit, but it probably is. Um, we could probably grab a little bit of this texture here as disgusting as that is. <laughs> um, and, uh, so let's, let's try to get a little bit of that too, since it's a good solid detail that I can, that I can use and be horrified by. Okay, so let's track translation, scale, rotation, shear, and perspective until we know better. All right, now let's take our surface tool and let's do this. Let's go, let's align it about where we think it goes. Okay. Like I'm guessing, if I had to guess, I'm guessing that's about, about where the corners are. Now, this is just based on my, my guess. But what I can do is inside of my track tab, um, I can, let's go to, mm -hmm -hmm. Hmm. Let's um, let's go to just our track tab and let's do our best guess as to where we think this is rather than get bogged down and all that. All right, here we are. So that's where I think my corners are. Let's go ahead and hit track backwards first and then we're gonna go ahead and hit track forwards. Um, let's track backwards. Track, 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 track. Looking pretty good. Not seeing a whole bunch bouncing. Pretty nice. 
Up, oh, I can see we're losing it. So you see how we're starting to go a little bit cattywampus. So I don't want to go cattywampus, which is a very technical term. So let's go ahead and turn perspective off and just use shear. And there we are getting something that looks a little nicer. All right, now let's go ahead and hit track forwards. Now you notice that you can just change this data anytime during your track. And why do you do that? Well, you want to get good tracking data and you do that by looking at what your track is doing. If your track isn't behaving properly, what you can do is you can turn off things like perspective because what perspective is doing is perspective is trying to invent perspective based on what it can see. Okay. And sometimes when you have a lot of flickering, like these shadows from these fingers, perspective is a little bit more sensitive than shear. So sometimes you can just turn perspective off and you can get something that moves accurately, even if it's not moving perfectly in perspective, but you're not dealing with that calculation for perspective. So you get a little bit less wobble. That is a trick that you can use when you are tracking this kind of stuff. Now, the only thing that's important is that this looks right. Okay. It's not important that it be, you know, mathematically perfect. It's important that when you composite this, it looks the way it's supposed to look. All right. So I can see, let's stop. I can see that I'm wobbling a little bit here. Okay. We'll see that when we're tracking. I mean, when we're um, compositing, so I don't want to deal with that. So let's go ahead and take translation only. Use translation only for a second and finish tracking. And so now what we can do is we can do that thing that I was talking about earlier, where we can do a one point correction. So let's go over to our adjust track. Let's use translation. Let's set our points and select them, set a reference frame, jump all the way over here. And I can see right about here is my last good frame. So let's just make a little keyframe. And you can see that we need to correct over time. All right, just like this. All right, so that can be our lovely track. Now I could also use two points because if I look here, let's um, let's actually change that because I don't like the way that looked there at the end. I feel like I needed at least two points of correction, but I probably actually need three because I need to deal with shear. So let's actually go back to our first frame. Um, let's actually reset this in our adjust track. So let's go ahead and go up to three and let's set our points. Okay. And now let's select our points and set a reference frame here. Jump ahead to our last good frame, which is right here. All right. And so let's once again, let's select our frames, select and let's nudge this. Now let's go to the end here and let's correct. So I'm going to move this down and over. Okay. And I'm going to select this point and let's move this just a little bit like that. There we are. All right. So that's a little more accurate. Yeah, that's, that's correct. All right. So now, now I've got this track. I like the way it looks. Okay. And I can start doing my composite based on this. Okay. So we'll call this screen track just like that. And let's go back to our track and let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit. Perfect. Okay. And now let's go ahead and put an insert clip in just like this. And we'll once again, go back over to our insert, turn our motion blur on, turn our overlays off and let's render this and see what it looks like. And what I like to do is I like to check the grid render um, because that usually tells me if I have something that I can't see. The grid, you can use the grids anytime, um, but I like to use the grid in a render because it'll tell you right away if you are shifting. Um, way more than whatever image you're looking at will because if you put a screen on there and it's whatever screen you're gonna use as your final composite, um, sometimes it can be hard to see any slipping, but grids don't lie. Grids are extremely unforgiving. So that looks pretty good to me. I see that that is moving along. Even though we're totally off screen, we're ending up with something that looks pretty nice to me. 
Now, obviously, you'd have to go in and roto fingers and put those back over the top and do a nice blending mode over the top to get that to fit nicely within the screen. You know, we can do things like even in um, in our comp here, we can use a blending mode like a screen, you know, and we can take this opacity down just like this. And we can, you know, render that as well if we want to get it to blend better. Your mileage is going to depend based on what you're looking at. So sort of sort of a cool option inside of Mocha to use, but this is what our, our track ends up looking like. So that is how to, that's how to track two very difficult shots that go off screen using things like manual track, adjust track, and regular tracking. And it's a big breakdown of how we do um, in-depth tracking using Mocha Pro. We solved for lenses, we solved for manual tracks, we solved for adjust tracks with multiple points, um, including up to four corner pin corrections. And I hope that that answered a lot of your questions about adjust track. Let me come over here real quick. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions, I am happy to answer them in the chat while you still have me. I've got a couple of minutes left, but we really appreciate you tuning into these office hours. We do them every Tuesday at one o'clock. Um, it's a good way to sort of peer into my brain and uh, talk to me or members of our team about what you want to see in our products and also just sort of just see how the products work, how they work on difficult shots. Uh, in these shots in particular, a lot of times I will try to prep shots before um, before the walkthrough, but today I didn't. I actually just, these were totally on the fly. I've never touched them before. I didn't see them until this morning where I downloaded them because somebody on the forums had asked us a lot of questions about Adjust Track and how to use them. And um, we're sort of expressing some of their frustrations with some of the pain points with Adjust Track. And we just did this on the fly to sort of answer your questions. If you have any shots that you can show to other people that are allowed to be, you know, broadcast online, you can send those to me and I can work them into the next office hours. Um, if you're having trouble with something, you just go ahead and email me at maryp at borisfex.com and I'll see what I can do to answer your questions more in depth in the upcoming weeks in the upcoming office hours. Please like and subscribe if you have not, if you want to get more, you know, uh, notifications on these updates. And we really appreciate you tuning in. <clears throat> so, um, I see one of the questions here is, I'll have to study when to use perspective tracking um, after this live. So I just wanna talk about the when to use what kind of uh, tracking data, okay, really quickly. So translation only, that's your X and Y data, okay? When you are, when you are changing the um, options inside of the track tab, those options matter. Translation is for X and Y only. It's for doing things like putting in text and titles, uh, track to something. Obviously, you don't want a text and title to shift and wobble around, okay? Um, so translation only is for translation only. It's for things like point tracks, okay? What you would normally use a point tracker for. Uh, translation and scale, obviously, is going to be your movement in X, Y, and also your scale of an object, okay? Uh, rotation, pretty obvious, all right? But where people get really messed up is shear versus perspective. Normally, on the shot like I just showed you um, with the computer screen that was an extreme close-up, you normally would want to use perspective on that shot because it is moving in perspective, right? In Z space, all right? But we got better results for that one shot by turning perspective off because we treated it like shear. Shear is a warp in X and Y, but not a warp in Z space, okay? So we accounted for the warp of the image in 2D because obviously when we are filming something, we are translating a 3D object into a 2D plane, okay? And then we're, anytime we do 3D tracking or anything like that, we're always inventing like, a pseudo space, okay, a pseudo 3D space around what is essentially a 2D image. And we can move it around in that space based on our 3D tracks, or in this case, our 2.5D tracks. So in Mocha, the reason that worked is because perspective is really sensitive because it's looking for that Z space motion. So if there's a lot of lighting flicker, sometimes perspective can interpret that as a warp in Z space and it'll make the object wobble, you know, your track wobble. So we turned off perspective tracking for that last shot and used shear only because when we would normally use perspective for that shot, when we practiced that shot, okay, we noticed that the perspective did not give us the proper results. So we started turning off our pieces of our algorithm until we got a smoother track. So that's just something that you can 
learn from experience and there's no good way to sort of uh, know when you're going to encounter that problem or not. You, you can use your best guess and then you can look at your results and then you can adjust based on your results. You know, all of these things that I'm telling y'all are not hard, fast rules. What they are is troubleshooting, okay? Because every shot, as you guys well know, has to be troubleshot, right? Like um, nothing is going to just work perfectly every time, especially not in the visual effects world. So there we go. So thank you so much for tuning in. This has been Office Hours. We do these every Tuesdays at one o'clock. Every Tuesdays. Every Tuesday at one o'clock. And um, like and subscribe. Leave your comments. And we hope that you enjoyed this and found it super useful. Have a great day. I will see y'all next week.